TikTok is a hotbed of bad takes and bigotry, and there are plenty of people on this platform who've talked about it before. Self-made millionaires, alpha male podcasts, and conservatives larping as centrists have sort of taken over the collective consciousness of commentary channels and bread tube alike. People like Andrew Tate, Fresh and Fit, and Kevin Samuels are content. They're easy content that can be picked apart with a surface level understanding of misogyny. But most commentary channels will stay away from the, dare I say, politically charged content. What if I told you there was somebody who checked all the boxes? He was, as he claimed, a self-made millionaire, he has his own alpha male podcast, and he's a conservative larping as a centrist. But who is this mystery man? Well, if you don't know, then you've done yourself a disservice, because he is the man. He's the myth, the legend, the real estate agent, the youngest one in Long Island, actually. In case you didn't know, he's smart, he's cunning, he has a business mind like no other. He is Liam Rosenberg. And look, I know what you may be thinking. Sean, why are you telling us about Liam? He's obviously the most famous person to ever exist, to which I would respond, of course, right? But for the few poor fleeting souls who have not yet become acquainted, become acquaintance, but for the few poor fleeting souls who have not yet had a chance to be graced by the presence and the words and the wisdom of Liam, let me explain. So mid-2020, when I was heavily involved in political content on TikTok, don't ask, I had stumbled across one of Liam's videos. It was part of a series that he titled, Why the world is so fucked up in 60 seconds. And it was literally one of the worst videos I've ever seen in my entire life. And I've decided against my better judgment that people need to see this because it's, it's truly, it's truly a doozy. Now, to be as fair and as charitable as possible as I can be to Liam, I'm going to show the TikTok video in its entirety before going back and breaking it down point by point, just so we're not taking anybody out of context. You know, being 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 nice, being charitable, giving it, giving them a fair shake. This is the business tycoon, so gotta be fair to them, right? And so with all that out of the way, video one, run the clip, editing slave. I'm sorry, what? I just want to make that very clear. I'm going to play the video because I want to play the video, right? That, that's it. I, I'm my own person. This is why the world is so fucked up in 60 seconds. Human beings organize themselves into hierarchies. The structure of those hierarchies is determined by competence. To keep the hierarchy stable, we have two oppositional parties, the left and the right. Both are essential. The right's job is to maintain a free market so that everybody has a chance at success. The left's job is to give voice to the oppressed. Now, the reason that our world feels very unstable right now is because left-wing media companies, the ones that are supposed to be fighting for the oppressed, are actually owned by the people at the top of the hierarchy. That would be CNN, MSNBC, and other billion-dollar left-wing networks. And the reason that these companies are so big in the first place is because left-wing presidential candidates pay these networks hundreds of millions of dollars to make the other party look bad. They typically do this by using anecdotal stories to push a larger narrative. You can see how this happened with the murder of George Floyd or with the kneeling of Colin Kaepernick. These individual instances have led millions of people of color to believe that they are oppressed. Some other tactics include identity politics. If you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump and you ain't black. Staging fake stories or just by creating narratives from total scratch. Thanks for watching. This is why the world is so fucked up in 60 seconds. Human beings organize themselves into hierarchies. The structure of those hierarchies is determined by competence. Okay, so pause right there. This is patently false, right? What is essentially trying to say here that America is a meritocracy? That success in this country or becoming a winner, as he tactically put it, is based upon your own merit, your own skill, your own effort, which he calls competence. Now, while this premise that America is a meritocracy is false, I'd argue that even if it was true, it would be a bad thing. See, the concept of a meritocracy operates under the assumption that everybody is starting on equal footing, which we can obviously tell it's not necessarily true. Uh, and this is something that everybody recognizes, even capitalists, even conservatives. Uh, ben Shapiro will also recognize this as well. We can recognize that everybody does not start on equal footing. Disregarding every other form of marginalization and focusing strictly from a class analysis standpoint, there is inherent inequality within people the moment they are born because of the amount of wealth that their family has. And this inequality contradicts the initial premise that he's making that these winners are determined strictly based upon their own merit, skill, and effort. So his initial premise is 
false immediately. To keep the hierarchy stable, we have two oppositional parties, the left and the right. Both are essential. The right's job is to maintain a free market so that everybody has a chance at success. The left's job is to give voice to the oppressed. His next point is that the two political parties operate to keep the hierarchy stable. Now this is true, but not for the reason he thinks it is. Now before getting into his takes about the roles of the parties under the system, we have to first talk about why he's half correct. Now he actually does a little bit of literary trickery here that a lot of people won't actually pick up on. He said that the two oppositional parties are essential, but he actually ends up writing down the left and the right and then talks exclusively about the left and the right. To keep the hierarchy stable, we have two oppositional parties, the left and the right. Now, last time I checked, the left and the right aren't political parties. The political parties in America are the Democrats and the Republicans. And what he's doing when he's making this subtle change is he's associating the wide range of views that the left has with just the Democratic Party. And this may not seem like much of a problem until you realize that the Democratic Party in America operates with a more of a center-right political ideology or political leaning when compared to other Western nations. So when you broadly paint the left as you know, believing these things and the right as believing these things, you are kind of pushing the Democratic Party further left than they actually are. And this sort of comes to a head when he lists the roles of the political parties under the system. He claims that the right's job is to maintain a free market, while the left's job is to give a voice to the oppressed. A quick note, he's operating under the framework of this being fact and not his opinion about the roles of the political parties, or I would say like just the widespread ideologies which is not fact, it's just his opinion. Now, as he conveniently leaves out that most Democrats rock with the free market. Because this is a free market and people, we are a free market economy, they should be able to participate in that. Look, I'm a capitalist. This isn't about punishing anybody. They are capitalists. They are pro-free market economics, right? And so his analysis in this case is wrong. He says that the right role is to maintain the free market, but the left, which are the Democrats, are also trying to maintain the free market as well. Now he's correct here when he says that both parties want to maintain this hierarchy, which is capitalism, right? Both parties are capitalists. They are pro-capitalism, pro-free market parties, right? Both parties operate in a way that maintains the status quo and neither really deviates much from that status quo. So, I mean, he's, he's correct there, but he's wrong under his assertion that the, the Democrats are meaningfully different in that respect to the Republicans. Now, the reason that our world feels very unstable right now is because left-wing media companies, the ones that are supposed to be fighting for the oppressed, are actually owned by the people at the top of the hierarchy. That would be CNN, MSNBC, and other billion-dollar left-wing networks. Okay, so does he not think that right-wing media outlets are also funded by the people at the top of the hierarchies? Like, does he think that the, the right is funded by the, the worker, the proletariat? Like, I, I, I don't, they're, they're both funded by the same sources. Now, he's not necessarily wrong here, again, but he's wrong in his assertion that it's only the left. And this is completely disregarding the fact that he called Google and Facebook left-wing media apparatuses, which they're not, not in the slightest. Like, all media operates this way left-wing media, right-wing media, social media sites, social media businesses, they all operate to the same effect because they're businesses. Do you know what the common thread is between all three of those sects of media? They're businesses. They operate at the behest of capital. That's just how things work. Because left-wing presidential candidates pay these networks hundreds of millions of dollars to make the other party look bad. Like. Do you not think the right employs the same tactics that you're lamenting the left for doing? The right frequently and consistently stokes the flame of hatred and, and vitriol in their audience. If you were to assemble a list, a hierarchy of concerns or problems this country faces, where would white supremacy be on the list? Speaking specifically to Fox News, consistently stokes the flame of hatred in their audience to get their audience to do stuff. In other words, you're being replaced and there's nothing you can do about it. So shut up. <laughs> the Democratic Party is trying to replace the current electorate, the voters now casting ballots, with new people, more obedient voters from the third world. But they become hysterical because that's, that's what's happening actually. Let's just say it, that's mm. true. This is why you saw January 6th happen this way that it did, because of the, the media coverage that Donald Trump and other right-wing news sites were giving to the election cycle, claiming the election was fake and it was, you know, a sham. If you count the legal votes, I easily win. Because of that 
sort of framing from right-wing news sources, it all culminated into January 6th. So what you're lamenting the left media for doing, which they do do, I'm not discounting that, the right does the same thing. They typically do this by using anecdotal stories to push a larger narrative. You can see how this happened with the murder of George Floyd or with the kneeling of Colin Kaepernick. These individual instances have led millions of people of color to believe that they are oppressed. Some other tactics include identity politics. If you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump and you ain't black. Staging fake stories. And right here he calls out the left for weaponizing id poll identity politics against, you know, the wider masses, which again is not necessarily incorrect. The problem is, is that the right does the same thing. They weaponize the identity politics of being white, straight, Christian, male, what have you, against their audience saying, hey, you see these things that you are? They're attacking these things. And that's not good. You should be mad about that. This may be a lot of things, this moment we're living through, but it is definitely not about black lives. And remember that when they come for you, and at this rate, they will. So the same thing you're lamenting, the left for doing, the right is also doing. It's ugh, whatever. Next video, editing slave. Next video.